afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our first of our three virtual congressional briefing series focused on family and youth homelessness in the wake of COVID-19. Today's congressional briefing will feature youth voices and a youth panel, as well as Congressman John Yarmouth from Kentucky and Congressman Don Bacon from Nebraska. First, I'm gonna cover tech. So next slide, please. Oh, sorry. First, uh, the co-host of this congressional briefing series is Schoolhouse Connection. First focus campaign on children and the National Network for Youth, as well as Family Promise. Next slide, please. So for those of you who are not familiar with GoToWebinar, I'm gonna briefly go through um, how to use this technology. So this webinar is for you. Um, as we go throughout the content of this congressional briefing, we really ask questions. So you'll see on the control panel, you'll see a questions box that you can click on. Um, so please enter your questions in there um, and hit send throughout the briefing. We're gonna do our best to get two questions and answers from you all. Um, towards the end of the congressional briefing. You'll also see on the control panel that there are handouts um, posted. So we have four different handouts. One is a PDF of the PowerPoint for this um, virtual briefing. And then there's three different policy fact sheets as well. This webinar will be recorded and will be archived and it will be available on Schoolhouse Connections website and National Network for Youth website. Um, also, if you've signed up for this webinar, you will receive a link to the recording um, approximately an hour after the webinar has ended. Next slide, please. So today we're going to um, start off with some remarks from our um, special invited guests from the U.S. House of Representatives, and then we're going to have a youth panel discussion uh, facilitated by Jordan from Schoolhouse Connection, and then we're going to open it up to some Q&A, and I'm going to do a wrap-up with some high-level policy recommendations. So now it is my pleasure to introduce Congressman John Yarmuth to speak. We are so grateful for his long-standing leadership in fighting for targeted support for children, youth, and families experiencing homelessness. Representative Yarmuth. Well, thanks, Darla, and, and thanks uh, very much to the National Network for Youth and for all of the uh, affiliated organizations for putting this program together and for your work on behalf of America's youth, uh, specifically vulnerable youth. Um, uh, it's an honor to be with you. It's an honor to be here with uh, my colleague, Don Bacon, and it's, it's exciting to work across the aisle on, on something that is so important and can benefit so many people. The, I, I came upon this issue um, almost by accident, but not really, because the way I was first introduced to the challenges of, of runaway and homeless youth was through Safe Place, which uh, was founded in my district and is still based in my district. And uh, it was uh, very uh, enlightening for me and very compelling for me to uh, visit Safe Place and to meet with some of the young people whose lives had been saved. Uh, and I'm, I don't, that's not hyperbole. They literally were saved by um, the uh, programs run by Safe Place and also uh, through homeless and runaway youth, runaway and homeless youth. So I, I got involved in that issue my first term. I was the sponsor of the reauthorization at that time. This act goes back to 1974 uh, and have been uh, very much involved in it ever since. And uh, I, one, of the, one of the truly most uh, meaningful uh, moments of my congressional career, and I'm now in my seventh term, was <laughs> when we had a hearing in the education, then in the Education and Labor Committee, and uh, we brought a young man named Robbie from my district and Robbie told his story and how his life had been turned around uh, by these programs and literally everyone in the hearing room, Republican, Democrat, staff, uh, the committee clerks, 
and those who were there uh, in the audience were in tears uh, listening to his story. And so th that showed me a couple of things. One is how effective these programs can be. And secondly, uh, how, how easy it was to generate support for, for these programs because people understood that uh, you know, the, the, the stress that is on uh, so many young people in this era and, uh, and the challenges they face in many cases and the, and the I guess the, the value of, of saving lives and, and turning a, a vulnerable person into a productive uh, citizen and how, how uh, worthwhile that was. So um, anyway, it's been exciting to be involved in this ever since. The, the COVID crisis presents uh, additional challenges to many of uh, our uh, vulnerable populations. We know that those people who are homeless are much likely to have access to healthcare. They're, uh, in, in many cases, they're extremely vulnerable to, uh, because they're around a lot of people in similar situations. They're around populations where the, the presence of the virus is, is uh, uh, more frequent. And the, the, the extent of knowledge as to what to do uh, to either prevent uh, catching the virus or dealing with it once you've got it, or even testing to see if you've gotten it, is, is much less among this population. So uh, in this, this day and age, it, uh, it is so important uh, to, to support these programs, but also to listen to the people who are affected and the people who have friends and, and so forth who have lessons for us, to po us policymakers, who uh, can then take them and try to tweak our policies and our uh, investments to, uh, to better accommodate those people in need. I, I want to say one other thing. I, this is probably not uh, typical, not uh, characteristic of, of Don Bacon's district, but uh, I have uh, in my district, which is the city of Louisville, essentially, uh, one of the, I think we have, we're the 16th largest school system in the country. And uh, about 100,000 kids. And even in normal times, about 10,000 of our 100,000 kids are homeless. And many, many more are in a category where they are shuttled around from home to home, grandparent to aunt to uh, So that in my district, 50% of the kids uh, in, in Louisville public schools change schools at least once during the year. So, I mean, they have enormous challenges in terms of access to technology, in terms of continuity of instruction, people who understand uh, their learning, uh, learning techniques, their, uh, their abilities, their weaknesses. Uh, so you, when you take a setting like mine and you overlay the, the general population problem with runaway and homeless youth and the incidence of abuse and so forth, uh, you, you can see clearly how this is such a significant uh, thing to me. So um, I'm just glad to be here. Uh, we, we are fighting uh, every day for programming, for funding. Uh, we're in the appropriations process right now for uh, fiscal year uh, 2021. We are, um, I think the labor H appropriations bill was just reported out today. Uh, it had um, a $7.5 million increase uh, in the bill for uh, for Runaway and Homeless Youth Act, and then uh, an additional on the, the Education for Homeless Children and Youth Program, which I know is important to, to a lot of you. Uh, there was an increase of uh, 1,150,000, which was a small increase, and we're going to push for more. Uh, so you know, obviously, we're spending money as, as if we are uh, have the printing presses going full speed these days, and uh, which we do. And uh, so it's going to be funding is always a challenge. But uh, again, this is the type of investment that I'm convinced, and I know Don is as well, is the type of thing that pays off many times over uh, for every life that uh, we're able to, to save. So we're going to keep fund pushing for that. And I look forward right now to shutting up and listening to uh, both to Don and then 
uh, the others involved who are in the trenches every day who are working with these programs so I can learn better as to what we can do better. So thanks for allowing me to be part of it. I look forward to the Q&A later on. And uh, now I'll go into listening mode. <laughs> Thank you so much, Congressman Yarmuth. Uh, we really appreciate all your work. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Congressman Don Bacon to speak. Congressman Bacon has been a champion of children experiencing homelessness. I'll hand it over to you, Congressman. Oh, you're on mute, I think. Thank you. I was trying not to make noises while John was talking, but got to remember to turn it back on. <laughs> so I want to thank you. First of all, it's a pleasure to be on here with uh, Congressman Yarmouth. Uh, my, my wife's family's from Greenville and Paducah, Kentucky, so I got a lot of Kentucky uh, roots. And he is absolutely right. Johnson, I want to appreciate your, first of all, I appreciate your comments. But this really is an issue that transcends party. Uh, you know, it's a, we all know that we need to have a quality and good foster care program. And this is not a Republican or Democratic issue. And I've worked on a couple of bills with uh, John, uh, who's with us, who just was on, Mr. Yarmouth. I've also been on a lot of bills with Karen Bass, who's from Los Angeles, California. And also uh, Jim Langevin is another uh, guy that I partner with, partnered with on quite a few different foster care bills. And so I like it. To me, it's, uh, it is an opportunity to do something noble and right. And it's something that bonds Republicans and Democrats together. Uh, so I'll just say that right up front. Uh, I, do, I do thank the youth leadership and scholarship team for putting this together and the schoolhouse uh, connection uh, for doing this today. And I, I, appreciate, I look forward to also hearing our four panels uh, behind, the, behind, behind the two of us that just spoke. Uh, I would, my, my connection to this was uh, when I was, I did 30 years in the Air Force and my dad became a foster parent, uh, but wasn't foster to adopt, but he helped probably about 10 different children uh, during the course of his doing foster care. And that was sort of my first, uh, you know, initiation of what what's going on. And frankly, what I learned was, you know, there was folks looking for, you know, of their permanent home or their, their lifetime family and and then you, and you knew the challenges that these uh, young folks went through no fault of their own but was you know the parents and that wasn't surely the children's fault so it sort of turned me onto this and and i would say secondly my my faith-based background I'm a, I'm a christian i feel like we have an op a re responsibility uh to do to do something here to support uh children who are in need and need need a loving home and so that's sort of my foundation so at the age of about 40, 40 years old or 45 years old, I have to go back and I was actually 40 years old when I started the foster care program myself. I was a Lieutenant Colonel in the Air Force uh, in Washington DC area. And we ended up having two foster kids that we ended up adopting. Uh, and they were eight, nine years old when they became part of our family. I already had two older sons, a wife and I did. And uh, today uh, our eight, nine year old foster kids that we adopted, are now 24 and 25 years old, and they're doing doing very well. And uh, so I have uh, my 25 year old son, Austin's, uh, uh, has his own business, and he also works. He's, a, you know, he's got two jobs, so he's uh, surely a hardworking guy. And I get to see him when I go to D.C. He lives out in Fairfax. And my uh, 24 year old daughter, uh, she's married, has a job, has a daughter. She's a wonderful mom, wonderful wife. And I, one of my takeaways from this is when you invest and people good things happen and it's a joy for me i, I hope i live a, another 30 40 years we'll see but it'll be a joy that i'll always carry with me uh, that we've had some positive uh, impact there so that's what got me involved with the foster care caucus in congress when i got elected in the 115th congress because i know there's a need there you know we our goal is to have loving families and if families are struggling to help provide the support uh, to heal uh, but sometimes it can be healed and so there is it is imperative that we have a quality foster care program and it's largely state driven so it always makes it a little complicated our role at the federal government level but i'm not above trying to figure out how the federal government can help out states do a better job here so that gives you my background and, and why i'm involved uh, there's always been two areas of interest for me in this and i think these aren't aren't you know, uh, unusual. I think most people involved in this know these are the common issues that we need to to, to improve. Uh, transitioning obviously is the key the key one, and I know that's a, a 
big, big focus of our topic today. And I'll just say, I, I learned from my own experience. When I was 18, I could not have been on my own without my, my parents' help, right? In fact, I needed help till I was 20. <laughs> and then I joined the Air Force and started, and I still needed a little help, uh, but the Air Force pretty much gave me some independence there. And I know all four of my children needed help beyond 20. And uh, so my point is, my experience is, is that every, most every kid needs help. Uh, and so this transition, you gotta have a safety net for someone transitioning out of the program. And I tell you, I've, if I was 18 and you would have told me I gotta pay federal taxes, I would have had no idea. How do you do that? You need, you need a, uh, two, two rent checks for a deposit? What the heck does that mean? You know, I, that, that wouldn't have made sense to me at all. And uh, how to get health care? I would have been clueless where to go get health care. And so I could just, I would have needed uh, not only the financial help, but just the uh, counsel and wisdom to know how to uh, proceed and become independent. And I think everybody uh, needs that. And thankfully, I have parents to do that, but not everybody has that. So we have to find a way to ensure that we successfully provide all the tools that we can uh, so our, our young foster youth, as they transition, uh, have, have a lifeline and, and a transition that is successful so that they know where to get the resources possible. And I think you know, we need that for housing. Housing is hard. If you got to have a double deposit for a rent, that's a, that's a huge challenge. So we need to find a way to, to help folks transition to have a, a, a good housing plan that, that, that helps them find a good place to live. And we don't find and so they end up homeless, which we know that the number one homeless denominator is, you know, our foster care youth, which is a, a total, which is a real shame uh, in my view. We also got to find ways to help out folks get an education and a trade right, or whatever interest areas there are. And so we wanna help out with that as well, because a good education, a good trade, or whatever uh, skills that we can do so people can make a good living, that is a lifetime of in independence. And then we're helping out that individual uh, have a successful family of their own uh, when we do that. I also say healthcare is an issue. I've, I, I shared with some of the folks on here before we went live, that I was recently talking to a young adult who was through foster care and transition, he told me for three years he didn't have health care. I go, that's terrible, but you had health care. It was, you had the community health center right there. He goes, I, I know, but I didn't know that at the time. No one told me. So he had, so that's part of the deal is helping connect our folks transitioning to resources so they know, we know where to get help and where, where to get the care needed. So I really feel like that's a big part of what we got to do. So transitioning is always, it's near and dear to my heart because I fully understand just from my own experiences, why that's important. Uh, and then other thing that I'm, I worry about is sibling connections. I really find that you know, I, I'm the oldest of nine. My best friends are my brothers and sisters. And to have been separated and maybe not know where they're at would have been very traumatic for me. So we need to find a way to improve those sibling connections uh, so that that family's there beyond the foster care uh, timeframe. I know John uh, or Congressman Yarmouth already talked about this, but I'll just mention three things I think we've done through the COVID because we know the COVID exacerbated some of these problems. We did put $25 million in the CARES 3 bill, uh, which was to help out uh, homeless uh, youth, primarily focused on our foster care youth. And so uh, I know here in Omaha, we have a, a, a youth emergency services program that used some of this money uh, and it directly went towards 18, 17 year olds, so whoever it may be uh, that, were, that were homeless. So this money is going to very good, uh, very good use. Secondly, uh, Congressman Yarmouth and I have partnered on a couple of these bills, uh, but I'm uh, a original co-sponsor for HR 6848, which is the Bipartisan Pandemic Protection Bill. and basically extends the Chaffee program during COVID so people aren't cut off uh, as they reach a certain age point. We think we want to extend this during the COVID so folks don't lose uh, the resources that come from the Chaffee funding. And further, I'm also a co original co-sponsor in HR 67, 66, which increases funding uh, for the Chaffee program, but also extends Medicare for those in the foster care program until they're 26 years old. And I'll just close on this. We know in the ACA, we put in the bill that folks can stay on their family's uh, health care through 26. But how does that help a someone that's in the foster care program, right? So that's why we want to extend the Medicare program until they're 26 as well. So you get a similar coverage or protection for those who were in the, uh, the foster care program. So 
I'll close with that. Just say it's a privilege to be on here. I, I always learn from this. So I'll be taking notes, and I look forward to being a, a good listener at this point. And I thank again, uh, John, uh, for partnering with me in this program and so many uh, different bills and things that were and letters that we've worked on seeking funding. So thank you for the time. Thank you so much, Congressman Bacon. It's great to hear such a personal connection from both uh, from both you and Congressman Yarmouth and your passion for our issues. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Jordan Rourke, the Director of Youth Leadership and Scholarship at Schoolhouse Connection, who is going to be moderating our panel discussion. And I will also be going on mute and taking notes. Hi everyone. As Darla mentioned, my name is Jordan and I direct Schoolhouse Connections National Scholarship Program. My passion for serving and working with children, youth, and families experiencing homelessness stems from my own experience as an unaccompanied homeless youth. As representatives Yarmouth and Bacon shared, you know, in, in general, it's difficult for vulnerable populations, but we know especially so for children, youth, and families experiencing homelessness and even more so, especially now that the COVID-19 outbreak has happened. Um, and so today uh, we will be hearing from four or five panelists if our fifth is able to join um, and talk about both their experiences of homelessness as well as how the COVID-19 outbreak has impacted them. So in an effort to not waste any more time, let's jump right into the panel. Uh, can, panelists, can you tell us a little about yourselves? Yes, hello everyone. My name is Christine Delianne. I'm 19 years old. I am a rising junior studying communications at Stanford University. And right now I'm interning at both a media for good company called Golden Hours Production and um, at my university's career center for diversity um, catalyst. That's me. Hi, um, my name is Han Johnson, and I am a rising junior at Weber State University, um, studying archaeology and environmental studies. Um, presently, I'm working with the National Network for Youth as a youth advisory member, and then uh, working at a local call center. Okay, Anthony, you can go next. Hello, um, my name is Anthony O'Leary. I am 19 years old. Um, I'm actually a former foster youth. Um, I currently attend the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA. I just finished my first year. I'm currently studying um, sociology. I'm definitely interested in um, getting into the sports management field once school ends. Um, and that's just a little bit about myself. Um, hi, my name is Yesenia Garcia. Um, I'm 18 years old, and in the fall, I'm going to attend Heritage University on a full ride scholarship. Um, what else? Oh, I work at Swan Vocational Enterprises. It's a vocational training program for Native youth on the Yakima Reservation. Um, yeah, that's me. <laughs> Awesome. Um, so now panelists, can you share a little bit about your experiences of homelessness prior to COVID-19? For sure. Um, my experience has been cyclic. I've moved 18 times in 19 years, transitioning between housing rentals, shelters, and motels. Uh, the period of homelessness that is the most distinct in my mind, I'd say, is when I slept in a storage unit for five days the summer before my junior year of high school. What happened was um, my family was evicted from a motel because we were short on cash. My mom was working as a nurse, but her next paycheck wouldn't come for another five days and the owners weren't gonna wait. Um, so we reached out to shelters, we were turned away um, and we were renting a storage unit where we kept our non-carry on items and having nowhere else to go we decided to sleep in it and while my mom would leave for work at like 6 a.m my sisters and i would 
walk with her to the train station and then walk to the public library to wait for it to open. We had $12 to ration over the span of those days. So we sustained on like dollar hot dogs at 7-Eleven and hot fried chips. And we relied on the public library to wash ourselves, change our clothes and work on our summer assignments because the grind does not stop. Um, and then at the end of the day, we'd meet our, my, our mom at clothing and we would go to the unit and do the same thing again the next day and then the next four days after that. Um, we survived eventually getting into a motel, but the stress didn't go away. I think the hard part about constantly moving from place to place um, is never knowing when the rug is going to be pulled out from beneath you. Maybe that last paycheck isn't going to be enough and you'll find yourself free falling without a safety net, scrambling to be in a good position to stabilize yourself or what comes next. So that's just a little bit about what I went through. Um, so my homeless journey started almost exactly three years ago. Um, I grew up in an extremely abusive situation with a mother, a single mother who had unmedicated mental illnesses. Um, when I was in seventh grade, I had first reported my abuse to the proper authorities, to the Department of Child Services. Um, and because I was expected to have good grades and I did have good grades, the social worker who was assigned to my case laughed at me and said children with straight A's aren't abused. Um, so after that I realized that there wasn't really a government agency that could help me. Um, so flash forward a few years to the summer before my senior year of high school and I was at a point in my life where I thought my mother was either going to kill me or I was going to kill myself. Um, she had been waving knives around at me and threatening me and uh, completely like eliminating my self-esteem. So I didn't have much hope. Um, I knew that I didn't want to die though. So I packed a bag and I ran away. Um, by sheer chance, I had heard about our youth shelter in the community that opened only a couple years before that. Um, and I was able to go to that shelter. Um, and stay there for the duration of my senior year of high school. Um, some of the challenges that became during this time was, you know, getting to school by myself. There wasn't really like shelter resources and then being fully responsible for myself without like any familial support um, and stuff like that. Um, so my, my time being homeless was definitely really tough. As I had said before, um, I'm a former foster youth due to physical abuse from, um, my dad, which was very unfortunate. I, uh, um, aged out of the system at 14 or 15, where my uh, great grandmother and great aunt actually took guardianship of me, which I was very grateful for. So I was used to, um, not not really having a consistent stable home throughout my life um so fortunately i was able to move in with them and um stay with them for a while and eventually i returned back to my dad who was actually working a custodian a custodian job at um, san diego state which definitely wasn't um enough to to live in um san diego even on uh terms of section eight in um living in affordable housing. So unfortunately, um, about three or four years ago, um, we were evicted from our apartment, um, having to go from hotel to hotel um, to sometimes even having to stay in the van, which um, was very tough. And during this time, I was also with my brother, which was probably the most standout um, moment through it all because me and my brother actually have a really strong bond. Um, okay, well, so I lived with my stepdad and my mother for all my life and with my five siblings. I'm like a middle child. And one summer, like 
I think it was like my seventh grade. Um, my stepdad said that he didn't want to work anymore. He just wanted to fish on the river to like, cause that's what he loved to do. So we just packed up and we moved. We had two tents, one big one for me and my five siblings and one for my mom and dad. Um, and our, we ended up losing our house because of it. So <laughs> we ended up just having to live in those two tents down in this like camp area by the river. Um, we had like a communal bathroom and um, we practically just worked to live. We just, my, I think my youngest was like six, my youngest sibling was six and you know, we were just out fishing all day, just trying to like have dinner. And um, there was a lot of just like staying with family and um, just trying to like mooch off of other people because we couldn't um, do it ourselves. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you guys for sharing. Christine, would you mind talking a little bit about what it was like staying in a motel and hotel? Yeah, um, it was it wasn't the best situation, primarily because uh, the hotels that we could afford to stay in were often, um, I guess, I don't want to say sketchy, but not the safest. Um, and that would mean that we were surrounded by, I guess, uh, a lot of sex workers and specifically the uh, the hotel I, motel I stayed in during my senior year of high school, um, there were a lot of sex workers and a lot of um, like panderers or like what people call pimps trying to like recruit me and my siblings and then constantly dealing with like hearing cases of domestic violence occurring like around you and always being not only concerned about, okay, do I have a place to eat? Um, do I have a roof over my head? But is it even safe for me to be here? And constantly going outside and leaving the room was also a risk, which me and my family had to do every day just to live our lives, so. Thanks. And um, the last little follow-up question to that one is, can anyone speak to your experiences staying with other people temporarily, um, whether it be during breaks when your colleges are closed or prior to college? Uh, yeah, I can absolutely talk about that. Um, so during my summers and my breaks, I don't have that family that I can go and stay with. Um, and so last summer I was able to do a conservation corps internship and spent, you know, my entire summer um, living in their provided uh, housing, which is a tent out in the middle of nowhere. Um, but during other breaks, I have to find people on a whim. And when COVID hit, my dorms gave us three days to find housing and not having a secure person I could go to to find housing. I had to reach out to literally anyone I knew um, in order to try and find housing. And thankfully, I was able to find someone. Um, but recently, they just asked me to find somewhere else to stay. And so I had to go through that struggle again. And so it's the struggle of not actually ever having anywhere you belong and not having stable housing to go to. And literally one person saying, you can't stay with me away from being on the streets again. Um, and it's this constant thing every summer and every holiday that I'll have to go to until I have, you know, enough savings to have my own place and have that secure housing. Thanks. Um, to be sensitive of time, I think that's a good lead-in to talking about some of the challenges that you all have faced as a result of COVID. So we know that the COVID-19 outbreak has had a significant impact on children, youth, and families of all ages. And I want to start by actually asking you to reflect a little bit. So can you take a second to imagine back in those stories that you told us of your K-12 through experiences of homelessness, what if COVID-19 had hit? Um, while you were experiencing homelessness as a K through 12 student. What would that experience have been like? And what do you imagine that some of the challenges would have been for you? Yeah, for sure. Um, I would have been more vulnerable with a 
virtual like learning environment that's in place. Um, a, because my main source of my meals came from free lunch programs and I'd bring food back home to my family. B, because the majority of my support networks worked in the high school building um, where I went to school. For instance, my assistant principal, McVitie, she had an office where she would let us like ransack the room for like tampons or razors and she'd bring us home cooked meals where we could eat there and sleep. And to be severed from that, those resources would have been nightmarish to say the least. But see, um, and I kind of touched on this previously, um, school acted as a partial shield from the violence and abuse I was exposed to where I was staying. Like even though I was staying in a motel and we had a secure roof over our heads, the situation was still scary. Um, the hotels, like I said, were cheap, but um, also dangerous. Cause I recall coming back from school one day and the police being outside our door with yellow tape because there was a sex worker who was assaulted and murdered in the next room. I remember coming home to a SWAT team, um, busting down a door across the room because they were, the people were hoarding like firearms. And like, again, like hearing domestic violence and cases happen all the time. And even considering how people interacted with me while I was in those spaces, like I'm a black woman and I present as a black woman, everyone in my family identifies and presents as a woman. And so I can't count on, I don't have enough digits on my hand to count the amount of times people have come up to me or crossed that boundaries and created a hostile environment. So with that in mind, I think that we would have I would have been more vulnerable if I wasn't at school for most of the time. And I can imagine COVID making that uh, even more scary. Yeah, and I, I really, you know, I like the emphasis that you placed on on school being more than your basic needs in education, because I think sometimes we get very focused on that. But I, th I think that you um, you worded it well in talking about how school for you served as such a support system and what that would have meant to lose it. Yeah. Um, my experience with this. So living in a shelter, we had 14 beds that were almost always full and also served as a drop-in resource center. So there were constantly people coming in and out of my house. Um, but we had 14 people living there and only six computers. So if my education had been moved online, it would have been a battle for who got the computers at what time and it would have been constant chaos. I mean, I even had a hard time doing my homework when I lived at the shelter just because there's always so much noise and so much happening and a lot of chaos. So it wouldn't have been an environment that's conducive with being able to learn. Um, even before I was homeless, if I had been stuck at home during quarantine with my abuser, I don't know if I would have survived that period. Um, summers, I was always doing school activities as well because school was my safe space and having that safe space completely taken away would not have been a good situation at all. Yeah, um, I, I definitely agree with everything all the other panelists say. Um, along with that, I think just, just going through these unreal experiences already um, in being homeless and going through a time that nobody really understands just in general, would be even crazier. Um, in my situation, uh, technology wasn't really available. So for students who are, are learning virtually um, on their laptops and things of that matter, I think it would have been um, nearly impossible for me to, to get the education I needed. And um, along with what Christine said, um, school was definitely kind of a getaway for me. Um, living in a house where where physical abuse was very common um spending that many hours in in that home would be even even more worrisome um to what could possibly occur um so i think uh just just having that education that we needed um obviously to learn but also as as our second home in a way would be taken away from us um, without things like Wi-Fi and things like that. Yeah, I agree with what everyone said. Um, when I was living there, like I, I don't know how <laughs> I would have made it either. Like with so many siblings and 
both of my parents um, were like drug users and my stepdad was abusive and there was multiple people in our camp that were like sex offenders and I was definitely sex abused and being trapped in that camp. Um, yeah, I don't know how me or any of my siblings would have survived living there for that long or still, yeah. Um, and there was definitely like, we, so we lived off of generators. So we would only have like an hour of electricity like per day. So I don't know how like, we wouldn't have done online learning because we couldn't, we just couldn't, um, yeah. Yeah, and, and Han and Anthony and Yesenia, I think all three also brought up an interesting point that for them it would have gone beyond access to laptops or even hotspots. Like yes, that would have been like a huge barrier, but even given the concrete basic resources, the chaotic and often abusive environment, it sounds like would have caused some significant barriers and just the the loss of a safe space and, and that support system I, I think would have been huge. Um, so now that you're in college, we know that COVID-19 has impacted you. So not reflecting, um, but more so just talking about what's actually happening now. So how has the COVID-19 outbreak impacted your housing, your education, and your health? Yeah, for sure. Um, again, I was uprooted from my previous learning environment, and I now rely on my house for resources that I received on campus that simply don't exist here. And during the rest of the semester um, under COVID, I was constantly juggling my school obligations and the stress of my mom being an essential worker in the only COVID designated hospital throughout Brooklyn and my sister being immunocompromised. And I think that definitely impacted me and how I interacted with like my schoolwork and even my mental health. So I'll put it briefly. Um, oh, sorry, go ahead. You're good. Um, for me, it's that same issue, you know, where I was given three days to find housing, which is already a stressful situation if you know where you're going, but having to find somewhere where you don't have a steady place is an entirely different level of stress. Um, another factor that played into COVID right now is the CARES Act funding um, that schools were supposed to distribute. My school sent us an email that our application for the funding were due that day and that it was first come first serve. And they sent this email and gave us like a three hour window to apply for this funding that I desperately could have benefited from. Um, and then you just add, you know, experiencing housing insecurity with the added stress of there being a global pandemic and stressing about what it's going to be like if you have to be on the streets and how you're going to protect yourself both physically um, from other people but also from the virus um, so it's it's been an absolute downer for my mental health um, yeah Yeah, definitely. I think um, everything everybody else said is definitely true, especially in my situation. Um, uh, upon attending UCLA for my first year, um, which was supposed to be a great experience, finally kind of getting into my own independence um, and living on campus in the dorms. Um, unfortunately, when COVID hit, our, our um, contract, our housing contract ended, my roommates um, moved out of the dorm and went back home. So that left me in a situation where I had to kind of figure out where I was going to go, if I was going to have the ability to stay on campus or not. And um, fortunately, I've, I've had the support systems on campus and off campus. Um, in, in my great aunt, who I'm temporarily staying with in, in a 55 and older um, housing um, area community, which unfortunately is is definitely temporary. 
Um, in in beyond that, on campus, I've had um, Bruin Guardian scholars who who is very involved with um, former foster youth, and I've, uh, I've I found a lot of support systems that I've needed for situations just like this. Unfortunately, I, I truly don't feel that um, the homeless um, population on campus is really um, supported like like the foster youth, the foster former um, foster care kids are are supported. And I definitely think um, it's it's definitely a lot harder for them in a situation like this. So in, in a way, I'm grateful for being a foster youth in this situation because I, I have been able to find those support systems um, to offer the necessities in a situation like this. Um, so last April, my mom passed away. So right after that happened, all six of us kids kind of just like spread out like my grandma would be like, one of you can stay with me and like kind of just like my family was handpicking us. And, but luckily my boss um, took me in um, into her family. So I'm I'm really like just grateful to have a stable home now that I've had for a year now. And I think now just with COVID, I can't see any of my siblings like I can't talk to anyone really I'm just kind of stuck here with this family that I'm living with <laughs> um I am working gladly like it's an essential place but um yeah I don't know what I would I would just be with some random family member <laughs> like probably still getting abused um without them so I'm pretty grateful with my situation right now yeah okay and I want to wrap up by providing you all a space to talk about where you found support as you navigated your experience of homelessness and what additional support you still need and or what would you want um, people working in policy or providers to know. So just a total wrap up of your final thoughts. Yeah, I love it. Um, I would say especially in my first year of college, I found support in Schoolhouse Connection, my on-campus um, first-generation low-income community, um, and like my supervisors at the Career Center, and even still like McVitie. Um, but I couldn't leverage or didn't know how to leverage resources outside of that. Um, and while like now my situation is getting better, I know a lot of families cannot access government aid or support, whether it's because of red tape, confusion, or technicalities. Um, for instance, like more often than not, programs serving homeless youth use HUD's definition of homelessness, but that ignores so many children staying with their families because people staying in hotels or with other people aren't considered homeless under HUD. Uh, for instance, like in my case with my family, I didn't qualify for any programs or not many programs, and I still don't qualify for those programs today. In fact, the previous times I filled out FAFSA, the application asks if the applicant is experiencing homelessness, which I was, so I check yes. Or and then it asks, are you awarded the state or uh, unaccompanied youths? I am not, so I check no. And then like an error comes across the screen because and saying like, hey, you made a mistake there, buddy. Like you said you were homeless, but then you said no to these two data points. It doesn't make sense. And that's because the application is set up in a way that it deems those combinations of experiences as incompatible with the definitions of homelessness it's familiar with. But yes, if you're living in a motel or staying with someone, you technically have like a roof over your head, but you're still bouncing around, you're still vulnerable and require a lot of support to secure permanent housing. Even while I was sleeping in a storage unit, I didn't qualify under those standards. So I think there's a critical need to increase funding or increase programming for youth who land outside of those definitions. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, so my biggest support, both in high school and in college, when I was experienced in homelessness has been um, the people who are in charge of my scholarships. They've been the people who are there and have been able to connect me with 
the academic resources I need, um, which has definitely been useful, but something I would like to see is a homeless liaison for college students, um, especially when it comes to filling out FAFSA, like Christine said. Um, my peers, it takes them maybe an hour to fill out FAFSA. For me, it can take anywhere from a week to three weeks because of all the information I have to gather. Um, I also have an ask for you all to go out into your community and find your local like youth homelessness or foster care provider and ask them what changes they would like to see. Because while we have a panel here of youth with diverse experiences, there's millions of youth with varied experiences all over the nation who need their stories to be heard as well and need their ask to be listened to. Thank you. Um, yeah, definitely. I think um, I'll, I'll kind of repeat what I said in, in the last answer. I, I found support systems um, on campus through um, foster care systems that, that um, support former foster youth and um, things of that matter. Um, I found support through, through scholarships, through um, people who worked in my foster care case and um, family who's, who still lives in California, fortunately. But in a way, I, I don't think that I would have all of this available to me if I wasn't a foster care youth at some point. And I think that is, is the matter that, that um, definitely needs to be headlined. Um, because in a way, even logging into my um, UCLA login, seeing the front page, you don't see support systems for those that are homeless, those that are in need of help that uh, attend the school every single day. Um, so, yeah. Um, so I found like a lot of help through the McKinney Vento Act, like at my high school. Um, it just like, it provided clothes, like food, it helped sign like paperwork that I had no idea like what I was doing. It, it pretty much like saved me. Like I probably wouldn't have finished high school if I didn't like know how to fill out paperwork without an adult. Um, um, and I think just like schools and like staff, like just understanding that, yeah, like not all homeless youth are like living in tents like I did. They're like hopping around. Um, like homeless isn't just like one, I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> like there's like just like a wide like variety of homeless um, standards and yeah, just just understanding that is important. Absolutely. Yeah, no, you all provided such powerful thoughts. Um, I, I think just in an effort for us to remember kind of what some of those were, like Christine, I, I think you mentioning the how restrictive some programs can be and the need for more assistance and programs for individuals that might not meet, meet um, HUD's definition, maybe more like can even tow programs. And then Han, I, your your takeaway is huge you know we we have the opportunity right now all 262 of us to hear from this panel of four students from all across our nation but what's beautiful is all 262 of us now have the opportunity to go throughout this next year and listen to the voices of those in our communities and i think that that is where true change happens um and then anthony's mention of you know the the need for increased services for children and youth experiencing homelessness outside of foster care and i i think that that's huge and then yesenia you talking about being identified in mckinney vento and and the difference that that made and the importance for um for educators and providers to to do that outreach and understand that homelessness looks a lot of different ways like what powerful reflections um before we move into the general q a i do want to provide a space for both representatives bacon and yarmouth if either of you have a question that you would like to ask the panel or any final thoughts um go ahead don you're first in alphabetical order go ahead <laughs> well I, I appreciate you giving me a chance to do it because i have to get on with the cattle industry uh meeting here in about seven minutes i think uh, but first of all thanks to john but thanks for our, our panelists what Thanks for sharing your heart, sharing your experiences. We learn from you and we all 
uh, and, and, and it really motivates us to want to do the best job we can uh, here. Uh, my question is, I also work with mentorship programs. Uh, would it have been helpful for you to have had a mentor avail available uh, so that you would have a single single like location to go to to ask for help on where to find better health care or how to do this or that? Uh, it, would, it, would it would have been helpful to you to have that resource available for each uh, of our folks who are transitioning out of the foster care program? So just curious for your insights. Um, I, I definitely think it would have been helpful for me to have had a mentor. I had a mentor who was able to help me navigate scholarships, and that's why I was able to get a full ride third party scholarship. Um, but I didn't have anyone who could help me navigate, you know, health care or dental care or even how to get a library card while being a homeless youth. Um, and those would have been things that would have greatly benefited my experience and my ability to um, be self-dependent. Thank you for sharing. Would anyone else like to speak to mentoring? Um, I, I could give a little insight on, on my situation. Um, Mr. Bacon, I, I applaud you for being a foster parent. Um, it, it's truly uh, touching to hear that. I think um, being in the foster, going through the foster care system, uh, I could relate to a lot of things that you were pointing out. In my situation, uh, I didn't necessarily have a mentor, but I did receive a court appointed special advocate, ACASA, in my case, where he um, was kind of like a, a father figure in a way, not as much of a mentor to the effect that he was. Um, showing me how to really grow into an adult experience and, and prepare for things like uh, taxes, healthcare, and things like that. But um, in a way, he was sort of a mentor. Thank you, Anthony. Appreciate you. Okay. Representative Yarmouth, do you have any thoughts? Oh, wow. Do I? Thank you for your time. Take care, Don. Uh, yeah. Okay. Gosh, so, so many, I'm not sure I can get them all out. First of all, um, I am just blown away at the strength that you all exhibit and the confidence that you have. And it's, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of reliving the, the, the scene I talked about with Robbie from, from my district and, and hearing people whose stories are so compelling and who have overcome so much. And you know what? If you all you're all going to excellent universities, and uh, your future is certainly far brighter than anyone would have predicted for you. I think uh, knowing how you got to this point, it, I mean, it's it, you know I hate sports interviews where where they say, well, what is it that uh, gave you the strength to do that, but can you do, you, do you understand where the strength come from, comes from to overcome these things because to stay with it and uh, to have remain hopeful uh, because I don't know where, I, you know, I've been blessed in my life. I don't know where that strength could come from. And uh, is there a way to describe it? Um, First of me, all, do you, do, you, do you think that you're strong? Um, sometimes. Sometimes I think that I'm strong. Sometimes I go back to the fact that it's just survival. I did what I had to do to survive. I've pushed myself so that I can live a long life and be happy and be successful. And thankfully, I have the mental state where I can do that and I have the resources that have helped me get to where I am. Anyone else have any thoughts on what led to strength? I mean, it's, you know, you, you probably don't think about that, um, but I'm sure there are thousands, tens of thousands 
of young people who had similar backgrounds who uh, were not able to overcome it. And, Absolutely. Um, so I guess the one question I would ask is, uh, if any, uh, this is this is not it, but I'll ask you, if any of you ever want to run for office, let me know. Um, I'll, whether you're Republican or Democrat, I won't care. I will support you uh, <laughs> because each of you would be uh, would add immeasurably to uh, whatever public office that you could occupy. But the question I, I think I have for you is if there were any one thing that you would point to that would have made your life uh, significantly better at any point going through this period, these periods, what would it have been? I mean, it could be simply, you know, if somebody handed you a bunch of money, it would have been, uh, Don mentioned the mentor mentorship program, you know, clearly, um, I think Christine, you said you had, you had a, somebody in your school who was very, very helpful with, was it that would have been that one person who who took you under his or her uh, uh, hand and and uh, made sure that you had uh, that you had somewhere to turn um, or yeah, Christine, would it, or would it have been something? Some somebody somebody said, okay, we're going to put you in. We're going to put you in a, a safe. Um, consistent environment, just physically. We're, we'll find you housing, and we'll make sure that it's safe and affordable, or that you, that you have access to that. What would it have been? That's a hefty one. Um, I think when I'm thinking, like, oh, would it be like a bag of money? I don't think so. I don't think it would have even been like a house. I think that what really would have made a difference is just like and I said before, is having like that safety net. Like, I think the reason why it was so easy to slip in and out like of like housing insecurity was because like one day we, my family would have it together and then the next we'd be back on the street. So even if it was just, I don't know, maybe if, if my family had more people to support them, and that's why I'm very grateful for people like Nick Beatty because when I was hungry, I that night I didn't have to spend money on food because she would bring us a meal. And I wouldn't have to spend money on an Uber because she would like arrange a bus. So that's an interesting question. But I would just say maybe like a safety net. Because yeah. a lot of times, you know, we're, we're constantly dealing with this question in trying to make policy in virtually every area is you know, sometimes government is the answer or can find the answer. Sometimes government's far from the answer. Uh, the answer is, in, you know, in Hillary Clinton's fa famous, it takes a village. It's, you know, it's, it's not always, there's not always a government answer to everything, but you know, that's what I do. So I'm curious as to whether there's anything that, uh, that government can function in. Thank you, Representative Yarmouth. Um, if you all think of any other responses, we're going to have a general Q&A. Before we do that, I want to transition back over to Darla, um, who's got a little bit to share. Hi, everyone. First, I want to thank our incredible young experts for speaking, sharing your life experiences with us, um, and insights and expertise. We're so grateful you took the time and um, joined us today. I also want to thank you, Jordan, for facilitating the panel discussion. And I want to spend a special thank you to Congressman Yarmouth and Congressman Bacon for joining us today um, to learn from our expert panelists, to share about the work that you have been doing. We are so proud to work with both of you to advance positive policy solutions for children, youth, and families experiencing homelessness, we, your passion and personal connection to these issues is just so apparent. Um, I also especially appreciated getting to meet your cat for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> she's getting used to she's getting used to these cameo roles. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's just a sign of uh, the COVID times, right? Yeah. Yep. I'm gonna 
Yeah, I'm going to do a brief wrap up with some targeted policy connections. I think as most folks know, um, the National Network for Youth and Schoolhouse Connection, our policy recommendations are directly uh, crafted by young people, families, and children who experience homelessness, as well as service providers and homeless liaisons. Uh, we are supportive of many different policy asks that organizations are advocating for related to housing, employment, eviction moratoriums, direct cash relief. Um, but we know that if we really want to provide assistance and services to children, youth, and families experiencing homelessness, then policies have to be directed specifically towards children, youth, and families experiencing homelessness. So one of our primary policy asks in the next COVID supplemental spending bill is for the inclusion of the Emergency Family Stabilization Act that's been introduced in the Senate. It's S3923. Um, um, this uses a broad definition of homelessness that every young person you heard from today said is a very important policy need and an existing policy barrier. Um, it meets families and youth where they are by providing resources directly to the systems and programs that already know um, children, youth, and families experiencing homelessness. It doesn't require them to go somewhere new, somewhere additional. Um, it's direct, flexible funding to community organizations and systems, including youth and early care programs. So it, it's able to meet a wide range of emergency needs. It does recognize what homelessness looks like for young people. how all of those um, forms of homelessness would be eligible to access services under the Emergency Stabilization Act. It would also fill a pretty large gap left by the CARES Act and the HEROES Act. Most of all of the young people you've heard from today, as well as um, the families they were a part of while they were experiencing homelessness, would not have been eligible to be served with HUD um, Emergency Solution Grant Funding, ESG. Um, so it, there is a significant gap um, and policy as it relates to homelessness and children, youth, and families are most impacted by the current gap federal response to homelessness. So we do ask that Congress includes the Emergency Family Stabilization Act in the next COVID supplemental and provide $2 billion of funding for this emergency fund. Also, as you heard Han share, she was only able to access support and services and housing through the Runaway and Homeless Youth Act funded program in her community while she was a senior in high school. By and large, most young people and certainly accompanied minors are not served by the US Department of Housing and Urban Development. The Runaway and Homeless Youth Act, um, which provides funding for street outreach, drop-in centers, short-term, long-term housing options, um, also includes maternity group homes for young families. These programs have been seeing an increase in need when even before the pandemic, as Han shared, most of the time, their bed capacity is completely full with a wait list. Um, so we know there's a tremendous need. We are ask, asking for Congress to include $300 million in funding for Runaway and Homeless Youth Act programs to be split between current grantees as well as to fund new um, programs in communities that don't currently have a Runaway and Homeless Youth Act funded program. And last but certainly not least, um, you heard about the McKinney-Vento Education for Homeless Children and Youth Act program that funds um, the homeless liaisons in public schools who uh, all of the young people who spoke today talked about how vital schools were. Um, school is often the only source of services and support for children and youth experiencing homelessness. Um, every student experiencing homelessness has a uh, desk. Um, and services in school, but most communities don't have a Runaway and Homeless Youth Act program due to the small amount of funding. So we know the McKinney-Vento Education for Homeless Children and Youth Program is the only federal education program that removes barriers to school enrollment, attendance, and success caused by homelessness. Local liaisons help identify homeless children and youth, ensure that their school access and stability provides them with direct service support, and coordinates um, with community agencies to meet basic needs. Unlike in previous disaster bills, neither the CARES Act nor the HEROES Act provided a dedicated line item of funding for the Education for Homeless Children and Youth Act, despite significantly increased needs. Um, so we're asking for 500 million to be dedicated to the Education of Homeless Children and Youth Act program 
in the next COVID supplemental and at least 300 million for FY 2021 appropriations. I wanna invite folks to stay. If they have time, we are gonna do some Q and A. Um, and we do have fact sheets about all of those policy asks under the handouts. And Jordan, do you have some questions that you wanna ask? And we wanna, Congressman Yarma, thank you so much for joining us. I'm not sure how long you can stay. Um, so feel free to stay for as long as you're able, but also if you need to hop up for the your next meeting, that's fine. <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, I appreciate it. I do have uh, something at 3.30, so I'll have to get off of that. But uh, once again, thanks for letting me be a part of this. And uh, once again, letting, uh, thanks for letting me hear from so many inspirational young people. And uh, that uh, it's the best thing that happened to me today, I'll tell you that. So thanks very much for all you do and, and all the people who are interested and, and uh, online uh, watching and listening to these great young people. Thank you. <laughs> so we only have just a few minutes, um, but I've gone through the questions and most of the comments and questions that have come through are big thank yous to, um, I'll quote one of them. Someone said, totally blown away by these genius young people. Um, so most of the comments that came through were people thanking you for your courage and willingness to share and for your expertise on these topics um, and sharing how helpful it was. But um, I do want to share that if your question is not answered, we will be archiving this webinar as well as repurposing it in a written format. So if we don't answer your question now, we may in the written format. Um, but given the tight time, I've got two questions I want to ask you. The first question that came in was what would you suggest that school systems and providers can do to best support children and families in this upcoming school year? Um, I would say actually like reach out to them and in more than one way, reach out to services that they commonly use because I know that a lot of children have slipped through the cracks right now. They've just disappeared. Um, so reach out to them and ask the families and the youth what they need. It's easy to assume that we know what they need or what they want in that time because it's what we would need or what we would want, but we're not in their situation. And so it's really about asking and listening. Absolutely. Um, and the second question that I want to ask, um, and feel free to also answer the first one if you think of something, um, but I want to throw the second one out there. What role do you as young people with firsthand experience see the federal government as needing to play in addressing homelessness? So this is what can schools and providers do? You can answer that. Or what do you think, you know, federal government wise can be done? Um, I, I just um, have a little, oh, sorry. Um, uh, you can go first, sorry. Um, so I think that the government needs to step up and provide both an increase in funding and an increase of programs. Um, Cause there's these very broad programs that aren't very well funded, but we need more specific programs that we're putting more funding into. Um, so I, that's my number one thing that I think the government could help with. Anthony. Yeah, definitely. So I, I kind of have more of an answer for the first one in just, um, just kids and adolescents going to, to school this next year. I think, um, this, at this time, it's most important for the teachers and school staff to, really um, use those connections with the students that they built. I think um, that this is the most important time for those kids that um, the, the differences are really being shown. Um, kids who are not in the same situation as, as the average student, quote unquote, is, um, are, are the ones struggling. And I think it's necessary for the teachers and for the uh, counselors in, in just, um, everyone in the school staff to really just have open arms, especially for those homeless youth 
who don't necessarily have a place to go for panelists. The panelists, just like us, we, in our situation, um, faced school being the number one getaway for us. And in situations for homeless students who don't have that, I, I believe that it's necessary for them to open up a, a safe space like a library um, or, or some place on campus, on school campus, to, to provide for those who are in situations like that. Christine? Yeah, bouncing off of that, um, I wish I could think of more, but this just came to my head. Um, specifically thinking in like rural areas, like try not to lose contact with like your students, because especially if technology is a barrier, it's very easy like to lose track of who's where. And I know that school was one place where like McVitty or teachers could be like, oh, Christine, like, are you okay? Okay, like you're safe, you're here. But like with technology and like virtual schooling, like that's not gonna happen as much. So like to be more intentional about that and yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. So I want to um, close out the panel discussion by thanking each of you. Um, I could not thank you enough. I know that this, it's taxing to tell your story. Um, and, and I know the importance of that. And I thank the attendees that took the time out of their day to, to listen to the voices of our panelists. I hope that the words of our panelists inspired you, but I also hope that you go away um, with a newfound perspective of the expertise that individuals with lived experience carry because you can replicate panels like this in your local communities. And so I hope that you take this and run with it and continue to listen to the children, youth and families that are in your lives. So thank you panelists, you all are incredible. I will now transition over to Darla for our resources and closer. Great, next slide please just have some links to resources so you can learn more um, about uh, the organizations that are co-hosting this congressional series, which again is Schoolhouse Connection, National Network for Youth, which I'm, my name is Darla Bardine, I'm the executive director of, I don't think I ever introduced myself, doesn't matter. Um, also Family Promise and First Focus Campaign for Children, please check out their websites, learn more about the work that all of uh, the co-hosts of this congressional briefing series are doing um, on these issues and more. Also, please sign up for our RE newsletter so you can stay up to date and get reminders. And the next slide, please. And another way you can um, stay involved is follow us on all the social media channels, um, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And we thank you so much for being here. I do want a final reminder that this is the first of a three-part virtual congressional uh, briefing series. If you haven't already registered for our other two panel discussions, I encourage you to do so. Our next one is taking place on Thursday of this week, uh, so the July 16th at 2 p.m. And that's gonna be a family um, experiences of homelessness uh, focus panel discussion. And then on July 22nd at 4.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, we are going to have a service provider panel discussion. Um, so please re register. You can go to either of our websites to find the links. Maybe we can put it in the chat box or it can be included in our follow-up email. But please register for um, the other two briefings in our series. Thank you so much for being here. Special thanks to our young people and our congressional champions who joined us. Have a great rest of your Tuesday, everyone. Thank you. Be well.